Let's open with a word of prayer. We're going to get right into the word of God. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just thank you for this opportunity to look into your word. We thank you that the interest of your word gives and brings life and light. Father, we're so ever grateful for the Holy Spirit, who is our guide, our comforter, and our teacher. We thank you for your presence here today. We thank you for the spoken word. We thank you that lives are changed and hearts are touched. Whether you're in the, on campus with us this morning, watching through any one of our multimedia devices, here, now, or in the future, we believe the word of God is alive and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and will change your life. Amen? Amen. Um, I'd like to tell you this morning that I'm going to wrap up this series, and I don't want your money, but it will all depend on time, a lot of material, and I want to just kind of take this portion of our money series uh, a little bit slower, because within this particular part of the series, I think is one of the most, it, not the most important, but it is an important part, and there's been a lot of confusion. You know, we were able to use a lot of common sense over the first couple weeks, borrowing, saving, um, con contentment, containment. So this week, we're going to talk about what kind of giver is God pleased with. We'll be talking about giving. And so I just kind of, I don't know if we're going to finish it because I, I've kind of got two little different parts. I've got the offering and then we're going to be talking about tithing. So, let me start out with this. On a Sunday morning, a preacher told his congregation that the church needed some extra money. And he asked the people to prayerfully consider giving a little extra in the offering plate that morning. And he went on to say, as a bonus, that whoever would give the most would be able to pick the next three hymns on the following Sunday morning. They could pick the, the first three hymns on that following Sunday morning. And after the offering plate was passed, the preacher glanced down, and in his excitement, he noticed that someone had placed a $1,000 check in the offering. He was so excited that he immediately shared his joy with the congregation. He said he'd like to personally thank the person who gave so generously. Now little, little Rosie was sitting all the way in the back. And she raised her hand. And the preacher invited her to come to the front to recognize her. And as she came... He expressed his appreciation again and reminded her that she could pick out three hymns. When she arrived to the front, she turned and looked over the congregation, then pointed to the three most handsome men in the building and said, I'll take him and him and him. <laughs> Unfortunately, over the years, Many preachers and churches have used uns unscriptural and unspiritual and mani manipulative, <laughs> that's a big word for me, manipulative, <laughs> methods to induce people to give. And I use the word to induce people to give. And I know that God is not pleased when that occurs, don't you? Because this word says so. You know, preachers have promised, and uh, I'm a preacher, so... I'm not, I'm not knocking preachers, but preachers have promised health and wealth and all kinds of other things if you'll just send them cash. If you'll just send them cash. And you know, there's actually documented uh, cases of preachers encouraging people to give large amounts of money <laughs> from their credit cards or on their credit cards with the promise that God will send them all the money they need to pay that off and get them out of credit card debt. You know, generally what they tell them is, get some Jesus on that credit card. Well, I'll tell you what. Many times, that's a fallacy. People do what they're asked to do, believing that what, what the preacher has stated is going to come to pass. And so, folks, let me first start out and say this. When giving, give with common sense. Don't be moved. Don't be moved by impromptu... Um, I don't want to say readiness, but excitement. What would be another word we could use? Really? To, to give. 
Um, the Bible is clear about this. I'm sorry? I remember one time, and I'll give you an example. Kim and I were at a very large, very large meeting. I mean thousands of people. And an individual got up and they, they began to give a call for an offering. It wasn't quite offering time, but it was one of those the Holy Ghost said type of things, you know. And man, and they called it a heap offering, you know. And so they just, people just start running down the front and putting checks and cash in big heaps and piles. And I got caught up in that. God didn't tell me to do that. But at the moment, at that moment of time, it seemed like the right thing to do. So, you know, not to be left out because, you know, I want to be a giver. I want to bless people. Not to be left out. I whipped out the checkbook and wrote the check. And I ran down there and I threw it down in the pile. And as soon as I did, I knew I was in trouble with the Lord. Why? It wasn't because my heart wasn't right. It was the fact that I didn't take time, number one, to ask him. Number two, I was moved by the call, not by the Spirit. And so you have to be careful when it comes to giving because there's a lot of good, wholeheartedly great ministries to give to. And you can be enticed to give when it's not right for you to give. Does that make sense? So, and this is kind of what we're talking about, you know, get some Jesus on your credit card. Unless God tells you, unless you got the money, honey, don't be, don't be charging money on your credit card to give to God unless he specifically, specifically tells you to and it comes in. Amen? Don't let people push you. You know, the Spirit will always lead. The devil always pushes and so be careful in your giving. Don't be moved by emotion to give, but by the Spirit of God. Be determined when going to special meetings what you're going to give in advance and you'll stay out of trouble. That's free. So, why is that? Because there's abuse and manipulation many times. Not always. But you can want to do something so bad that it may not be right for you to do it. But you're going to sacrificially give. And God's not asking you to sacrificially give at this point in time. Learn to hear what the Spirit of God is saying. There are times I've sat down to write a check to an organization or even to a nonprofit and, and just knew it wasn't right. Just knew it wasn't right. Well, you know, my heart said, I want to. I want the blessing. I want to be a blessing. And God's saying, yeah, but this is not the right ground for you at the moment. Does it mean that where it was going was, was bad ground? No, it just wasn't the right place for the seed for us. And Listen, man, if you listen to God, if you listen to His Spirit, we're to plant seed. Man, I'm telling you, it's going to come up and produce a harvest. Good ground. God will oversee it. So, but none of this abuse and manipulation nullifies what the true God-given principles and promises about giving that we find in Scripture and what we're going to talk about today. So be cautious, because the Bible also talks about, you know, wolves garmenting themselves in sheep's clothing. And as a pastor, I will tell you this. I, I mean... Over the years, over the years, and in fact, at, at our last building, not here because we don't office here, but where we used to office, I had to lock the doors during the day because there were so many people coming in with needs. Not every one of them was true. But yet, you know, you want to help because that's what Jesus would do. And I had to learn to say no. I had to tell people, you know, here's where we're referring. We're, we support this organization, and now we're going to refer to this organization because they, they're better at what they do than I am. So not everybody that comes and needs something is truly in coming to need something except your money from you. And we know that because we see the, the, the people on the street many times, the same people on the same corner day after day after day after day after day. Now God says, give, I give. And God has told me to give. 
then, then that's different. Okay, did I cover that all right this morning? Be careful with your money. God has entrusted you and has given you stewardship over that resource which he's already blessed you with. And then you have the devil who's trying to take all those resources from you in, and, and, and put it under the guise of need and God. So, all right, that was all free. I haven't even got to the first page. So we're in the first, we're in the, we're in the fourth and the last, well, it's not going to be the last, because I already see what time it is, the last lesson in our short series called, I Don't Want Your Money. And in the first lesson, we talked about our money, where our money comes from, and, and how we have to have the right perspective about money. In the second lesson, we talked about con controlling our spending through contentment and containment and learning how to live on that big B word, budget. Last week, last week, we talked about borrowing and savings. We learned that we should be cautious about borrowing and that some debt is better than other debt. And we learned that a wise person is the one who saves. Now, if you've missed any one of these sermons, over the last couple of weeks, I would encourage you to get a copy or listen to them at our website, online, watch the sermon. You can do it on, on hgc.church. Yep, hgc.church resources, or you can go to our YouTube channel live stream, and it's on Facebook. They're all out on Facebook. So today we're going to talk about giving, and we're going to talk a few moments with what kind of giver is God pleased with. What kind of giver is God pleased with? Why should we give? What does the Bible really say about giving? What does God expect from each of us with regard to giving? How much of my income does God really expect us to give? See, these are all good questions, aren't they? And I hope to answer them in the remaining part of this lesson. So, let's begin this morning and let's look at several principles of giving that might help us answer some of these questions. Principle number one, give wholeheartedly. Give wholeheartedly. As a backdrop for our study this morning, I want us to look at Paul's correspondence with the Corinthian church about giving. As we know, the Bible tells us that there was a severe famine occurring in Judea, and Paul was encouraging the Christians from other regions to provide relief for their brothers and sisters that were being affected by the famine. He was writing and asking for help and support. And so Paul wrote to the Corinthian church and told them about the positive example of the Macedonian believers and how they rose to the occasion to help their brethren. And we can find this in 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. And as we read the scripture, it says, Now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. One of the most severe trials, or out of their most severe trial, their overflowing joy, their extreme poverty, welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much, as much as, they were able, even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this, in this service to the saints. And they did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. The important principle here that I want you to see, or I'd like to address first, is the foundation for everything else is that God is ultimately interested in us, not in our money. And that's the title of our sermon series. And that's where we derive it from. I don't want your money. He's interested in us. And so God wants us to have a relationship with him. One that is based on our wholehearted devotion. He wants your whole heart. One of the commandments is to love the Lord thy God with your whole heart. Man, some of us, we love God, but he doesn't have the whole heart. He has a piece of the pie, but he wants everything. He wants you sold out, passionate for him. 
He wants, he wants to be the center of your life, the joy of your life. Man, He wants to be the glory of your life. He wants you sold out, wholehearted devotion. So, the Macedonians then gave themselves first to the Lord. Gave themselves first to the Lord. What does the Bible tell you? Seek ye first. Well, that's the King James. Seek ye. Seek first the kingdom of God. Man, when we sell ourselves out to God, we'll seek His kingdom. We'll seek His kingdom principles. We'll, we'll seek to promote His kingdom. He, when you sell yourself out, when you're passionate about the kingdom of God, when you're passionate about the Lord Jesus, when you're passionate about God, you sell yourself out. Seek first the kingdom, and everything else will be added. Man, I'm telling you, you when God adds, <laughs> woo, you can't detract from the fact that he's added. <laughs> Amen? So, we find then that the Macedonians gave themselves first to the Lord. And... Let me make this point. If we're not wholeheartedly then devoted to God, then the money we give to God really has little meaning. You say, you know, now, let me say, as a preacher, I'm saying, that's wrong. Anything you give, we want. But that's not true. Because you're not given to the preacher. You're giving to God. The preacher, the ministry, does not give the increase. God gives the increase. And so, if we receive a gift from someone, but, you know, that we really know that they don't really care about us, or that they're doing it just to pacify us and manipulate us, then that gift has little meaning, doesn't it? But on the other hand, if we know that the person truly loves us and cares for us, then whether the gift is large or small, it doesn't really matter, does it? The love behind the gift and the giver is what makes the difference. Isn't that true? Well, think about then that relationship with God. It has to be true with God, doesn't it? We must give ourselves first to God. Then God is pleased with our giving. And I'll tell you, if you'll give yourself to God, He'll be involved in your giving as well. So then, this leads us to the next point. Principle number two. Give generously. Give generously. As we move to chapter 9 of 2 Corinthians, Paul continues his discussion about the collection, or we'll call it the offering for the relief effort that was going on at this particular point in time. He reminds the Corinthians about the principle of generosity. So let's look at one type of, of giving Paul talks about here in 2 Corinthians called offerings. Offerings. You say, well, we're doing this a little backwards. But generally, we talk about the tithes, then we get to the offerings. Well, I think it's important this morning that we do things backwards. We're going to talk about offerings, and then we're going to talk about the tithe. And we're going to see the difference this morning. So the early church was receiving collections, or they were receiving finances to be sent out. Notice the word out for believers uh, in need in different areas. It wasn't staying in the house. It was being sent out. And the offering differs from the tithe. And we're going to be looking at the tithe in great detail in a few moments. So I don't want to jump ship here and just kind of move sideways. So turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 9 if you have your Bibles this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll begin reading in verse 1. It said, I really don't need to write to you about this ministry of giving for the believers in Jerusalem. So again, they're giving to an outside entity, a ministry per se. We would say they're giving to a ministry in today's society, another church. For I know how eager you are to help, and I have been boasting to the churches in Macedonia that you in Greece were ready to send an offering a year ago. In fact, it was your enthusiasm that stirred up many of the Macedonian believers to begin giving. But I am sending these brothers to be, to be sure you really are ready, as I've been telling them, and that your money is all collected. 
I don't want to be wrong in my boasting about you. We would be embarrassed, not to mention your own embarrassment, if some Macedonian believers came with me and found that you weren't ready after all I told them. So I thought I should send these brothers ahead to make sure the gift you promise is ready. But I want it to be a willing gift, not one given grudgingly. Remember this, a farmer who plants only need only who a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must decide in your heart how much to give and don't give reluctantly in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. And the scripture says, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. For God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. In the same way, he'll provide and increase your resources, then produce and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. Yes, you will be enriched in every way so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of the believers in Jerusalem will be met and they will joyfully express their thanks to God. So this is one of the promises that we have in the word of God. The greater the gener generosity, the greater the blessing. Jesus taught something about this in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38 when he said, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you again. And then in Proverbs chapter 11, verse uh, 24 and 25, we have a similar promise which says, One man gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly, but comes to poverty. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. You know, one of the things I wish I could tell you is how that works. Give and it shall be given, good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over. I don't know how it works. All I know is it works. I can't explain it, but I know it works. I know God is the God of increase. How do I know God's the God of increase? Because I'm living proof. Some of you are walking in the blessings of today of sowing throughout your life into the kingdom of God, putting his kingdom first financially, generosity. Every time, one of the things I'll say about this house, and I am so grateful when there are needs the generosity of this house is unspeakable. I mean, you rise to the occasion. I know we've had instances this year where people have had personal needs, uh, a water heater. I can, well, there was another one that we took care of. And, you know, we just asked you to help. We were going to do it wh whether you helped or not, but you rose to the occasion and you blessed these people. And I guarantee you, the moment that they stepped in that hot shower after in a cold winter day, they were thanking you. Amen. I'll tell you, there's, there's nothing better than a hot shower on a cold day. I hate knocking the ice cubes off my shower head before I get in. So God is faithful to his promises. As we talked about before we went on the air, you know, sometimes you're just going to have to say what God says. And you're going to have to speak what God says in the midst of what it looks like ain't going to be. And when it comes to our giving, we have to know that God will increase us as we are faithful to do what he says to do. And that is give. You know, conventional wisdom says this. Conventional wisdom says that if you want to have a lot, then you have to keep as much of it for yourself. But God's wisdom says that the more generous we are, the greater will be our blessing. And because there will be a greater blessing, then we'll be able to even be more generous. God says to give it away and it'll come back. You know, there's another scripture that says, cast your bread upon the water and after many days, it'll come back on every wave. God's banking system is not a hoarded system. It's a generous giving system. And over the years, Kim and I have proved, just like many of you have, that you cannot give God. 
Were there lean times? Yes, there were some very lean times. There were times where it was so lean that, man, you know, they wanted to come and get the machines. But God sustained us. You know, I remember one time, I remember one time, uh, right after we moved back into the city, we were living out in the country. We had a nice little acreage, and we still have a nice little acreage. But because of situations with John Michael, we made a decision to move back into San Antonio to be closer. And we got in, and man, the house was supposed to sell but didn't sell. We got into our house. Now we have two mortgages. And all of a sudden, the housing market crashed, and things got really, really tight, really tight. We've got two car payments. We've got two house payments. We're only supposed to have one house payment. And, you know, at that time, we didn't have as much money as we do maybe today. We would have covered it a little better. And so things got really tight. And um, there was no provision for nothing extra. And, man, we got behind on some things. I was seriously behind. And there were a couple times where they wanted to kind of come get the rides. And, you know, we were able to, to, to kind of facilitate getting the payment to them just to keep it. But, you know, I know maybe you haven't been there, but it's not a pleasant place to be. Maybe you have been there. But I want you to know that we paid two vehicles off in the most desperate, desperate time of our life financially. Months, months early. Not just, oh, well, here's the last payment. No, we paid them off early. We declared, we declared for years that our vehicles would be paid early. We, we wouldn't go to term. And, you know, here they are thinking, we're thinking we're going to lose our, our rides, you know, because it's just tight. Possibility of losing our house. But you know what? Hallelujah. God protected us. God made a way. I don't know how he did it. I didn't stop to bother to ask. I was too busy dancing for joy in the streets. But he made a way. You see, sometimes we don't realize that by honoring God through our giving opens the door of protection in times of trouble. Does it mean that I haven't had financial distress? Man, I had to learn just to rest in God at that point in time. I remember, I remember it got so bad, I was so stressed because, man, if you've ever been there, you can understand this. The possibility of losing our house, losing our cars, losing everything, and having to move back out into the trailer was not something I wanted to do. And, man, you know, it was real. It was a real possibility. And God, I'm, I'm speaking the word of God. I'm declaring what his word says over my finances. I'm reminding God I'm a tither. I'm the head. I'm not the tail. I'm the top. I'm not the bottom. My, my storehouses are full. That's what his word said. And yet here I am in desperate need of, in, in, uh, of, of financial, you know, financial gain. And right in the middle of the storm, I mean, right in the middle of the storm, and it's the worst, the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, it's going to turn around. It's going to be all right, son. Well, I knew it was him. And from that moment forward, I had perfect peace. You know, from that moment forward, it began to turn around. Within a few months, we paid off both vehicles. We were caught up in our house. In fact, we refinanced the house. When they said it couldn't be done, got a better interest rate. Why? Because God was involved in our money. Why was God involved in our money? Because we invited him in when we, when we applied his principles. When we said, we'll, we'll, we'll seek the kingdom of God. We'll be a giver and not a taker only. Am I helping you this morning? So conventional wisdom says that if you want, to, if you want a lot in life, you keep it. But God's wisdom says that the more generous we are, the greater will be our blessings. And... Jesus taught us this principle as well in Acts chapter 20 and verse 35. He said, it's more blessed to give than it is to receive. And he said in the 35th verse of, 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 of Acts chapter 20, <clears throat> and I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the, the words of the Lord Jesus. It's more blessed to give 
than it is to receive. Notice again these words. I've been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. Isn't that something? Many times in our society, those in the greatest of need, and I don't say this in a negative manner because there are people that truly are, are in need and will do anything, in, including work. But there's many out there that are in need, and the reason they're in need is they don't want to work anymore. It's just too easy to get it elsewhere. And in this house, we've had to have a policy. Our policy is, if it's truly a need, we'll help you. But the house comes first. There's no reason for us to, to help everybody outside the house when people in the house are dying. Does that make sense? You come here, you give here, you get help here. And so, you know, as I've often said, and others have testified, you cannot outgive God. You can't. Man, there were years I thought I'd never get there. There were years I thought I'd never see what I see today. I'd never live where I live today. I'd never drive what I drive today. There were years, I call them the lean years. But you know, there's seasons in God. There's seasons where you develop and grow. There's seasons where you begin to, to be a doer of the word. There's seasons then that God begins to reward you for your doing. And as the rewards come in, there's increase. And then you take that increase and plant it. I'm a firm believer of giving. I'm a firm believer of the seed time and harvest law. Where I'm not a firm believer in is I give you a dollar, you give me a million dollars. I don't see that in the word. I have to look at God as a husbandman. If I have one seed to plant in the ground, that one seed is not going to produce an orchard originally. It's going to produce a tree that will produce seed that I can reproduce another seed that I can reproduce. And eventually I will have an orchard. But I'm not going to have an orchard off of just one little tree one time. And I'm telling you something else. If you don't work that seed, protect that seed, prepare the ground for that seed, whatever you do, it ain't going to last. You have to be wise in your stewardship of the seed that God gives you and plant it where it's going to grow. That's a good place to say amen. Well, thank you, birthday boy. So, to review then, it pleases God when we give wholeheartedly and generously. Now, this is going to be a good place to, to stop because uh, uh, next week's Father's Day. So, what? what? Next week's Father's Day for all you ladies. It's a good time to come to church because we ain't giving those men nothing. Um, so this morning we looked at two principles. Give generously. Let me get back to my notes. I always like this. I get them all messed up. To give wholeheartedly and then to give generously. Next week, we'll, uh, the following week, we're going to pick up and we'll look at give cheerfully. And we're going to separate the tithe and the offering. This morning, we kind of looked at some scripture, how what the offering does is it supports outside of the church, basically. The tithe, it, it stays in the house to take care of the needs of the house and the ministers in the house. And we're going to look at that in greater depth and detail. I, I didn't get as far. I thought I'd at least get the offering finished, but I did not. So, man, hey, listen. It's been wonderful having you with us this morning.
Let me just close in prayer and let me pray for our listening audience as well. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just want to thank you this morning for this time. We thank you for the people who are watching through any one of our multimedia devices. We thank you for those that are in the house this morning. We give you glory and honor for the word that was sown. We thank you that it will bear fruit and it'll spring up. Lives will be changed and hearts will be touched. I want to give this opportunity to you as well. If you're on with us here on campus or you're watching through any one of our multimedia devices um, and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, man, I tell you, that's where it starts. If you're going to be a giver and a generous heart, that's Jesus. He gave, the Father says He gave His only begotten Son that us, we, could have everlasting life. Amen? We could have everlasting life. And because of that, we have an opportunity to be part of his family. And in that, we have an invitation for you this morning. And that invitation is simply this. Jesus wants to be part of your life. He wants to come in and, and, and just hang out. He wants to give you what he has. And that is eternal life. You know, there's, there's two things that happen in life. Birth and death. And everything in the middle determines what happens after death. Where are you going to spend eternity? Man was created eternal. We are alive forever. Though this outward man may decay and eventually pass away, the real you who lives on the inside of this flesh, the spirit man, is going to live someplace forever. And you have a choice today. If you've never accepted Jesus, you have a choice today to either make heaven your home and shun hell or spend eternity separated from God. It's, it's just that easy, folks. Jesus came and redeemed us. The Bible says he bought us back. He ransoms, ransomed us out of hell. A place where we were already destined to go because of one man, Adam. But because of Jesus, he changed the course of direction and he gave us a choice. Choose life, choose Jesus, or choose death, hell, and the grave. The choice was already made for us by Adam. To choose life is an act of your will. And all you have to do is ask Jesus to come into your, house, into your heart. How do you do that? Well, we're going to pray in just a moment. And we're just going to ask the Lord to do that. If you're watching through any of our multimedia devices, man, let me ask you this question this morning. If you were to die today, do you know with a surety that heaven is your home. If you don't, I want to give you that opportunity right now because it is a no-so gospel. <laughs> Man, I can't, it's one of these things, I can't tell you how I know, but I know that I know that I know. The moment I draw my last breath, I'm going to be with the Lord. It's a knowing on the inside of me. If you don't have that knowing this morning, I want to give that to you. It's just simply asking Jesus to come into your heart. Members of the congregation, I ask you to join me, with me this morning as we pray this simple prayer. If you're, a, if you're here on campus or watching through any one of our multimedia devices, you never prayed this prayer, man, I invite you to join us now in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, forgive me of all my sins. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart, become Lord of my life. I confess with my mouth what I believe in my heart, that you were raised from the dead. From this moment forward, I'm saved, born again, on my way to heaven. Jesus, you are now my Lord. As a minister of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, I want to tell you at this moment that all your sins are forgiven. You've been washed in the blood. You've been cleansed. You've been made new. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, please send me an email at info at hgc.church. We want to get you a little booklet and let you know what has happened to you this morning. God bless you.